Now, this speaker not only is obviously incredibly intelligent, but he's also got a bit of musical background and he's a DJ, so he wrote his own intro song. We, get, we shortened it a little bit, but we, it, you're, you're going to recognise the song, I'm sure. Please introduce our next speaker, Mr Billington. OK, goes like this. Steve Clasco's just a city boy Born and raised in South Philly, Troy <laughs> He grew up wanting to spin tunes and be a Philly DJ Jewish pitbull, not on the cards. He went to med school and worked real hard. Selling beer at the vet to make ends meet. Delivering babies. Up and down in Allentown, his 68 GTO driving here. I'm Steve Clasco, and I've had a hell of a morning. This morning, I woke up in 2030. Now, back in 2021, I was the president of Thomas Jefferson University and the CEO of Jefferson Health. Now, I'm the chief digital officer for the United States under President Taylor Swift. Yes, the Swifties became a real political party. And the president has just received word that there is a mutant strain of an RNA encapsulated virus that's been afflicting people in Australia. Of course, people old enough to remember, especially healthcare workers, the dark days of 2020 and 2021 and the COVID-19 crisis immediately panicked, but only for a second, and then they smiled because they knew that healthcare had evolved from a broken, fragmented, expensive, inequitable sick care system to a health assurance system where most of their care happens at home here in 2030. Since most of your healthcare data is now continuously streamed to the cloud and AI bots are constantly analyzing them for any changes, the early symptoms of this new virus were immediately identified and anyone throughout the world who exhibited those early symptoms was notified and asked to socially isolate. If needed, their employer was notified and asked for an excused absence. Software was immediately sent through the Internet of Things, what we now call the Internet of You, so your home 3D printer could begin to create masks for you and your family. Those who were having panic attacks, remembering the COVID-19 crisis of 2020 and 2021, could immediately communicate with their bot psychiatrist, and if necessary, could immediately receive drone-delivered treatment. There were no lines or concerns about food or supply storages for the same reason. Humans are not the dependent variable, as the fourth industrial revolution, drones, AI, Internet of Things, and robotics, have modified the supply chain, and there's no reason to congregate in crowded grocery stores or hoard toilet paper. The whole scare was over within a month, as new bioprocessing techniques were able to identify, develop, and test vaccines through rapid prototyping. Oh, by the way, instruction for K-12 students continued seamlessly as the United States had finally reached broadband in 100% of households by 2025. And just as healthcare at home was mainstream, so were creative ways of teaching in a variety of venues. Okay, so, so now let's travel back to the present in 2021. 
I'm committed to working with you to make sure that that brief time travel is indeed a reality. A far cry from what we witnessed in my hometown of Philadelphia and throughout the country during the COVID crisis of 2020. While not enough can be said about the frontline healthcare heroes at Jefferson and throughout the country, data was scarce and not analyzed in a coordinated fashion. There were different strategies in different states, in some cases, different counties of the same state. Jefferson Health went, as I said, from 50 telehealth visits a day to over 4,000 a day. But many health systems did not have the bandwidth to accomplish telehealth. And speaking of bandwidth, most public schools shut down for months as cities such as Philadelphia had a large percentage of the population without broadband or computers at home. The war on the underserved, which is what historians called the reaction to the 2020 COVID crisis, forced to change in payment models so that every aspect of the healthcare ecosystem was compensated for keeping populations healthy. Food deserts were eliminated through drone delivery and enlightened social and educational food programs. Payers and providers aligned once doing better, not doing more, resulted in higher payments. It was not an easy road. The dirty, not so secret of healthcare in 2020 was that almost everybody made more money when more people were sick. It was hard to get big institutions excited about changing something when their revenue depended upon them not changing it. So the healthcare industry had failed to transform itself over many years. Consumers, business owners, and all rational people recognized how healthcare had escaped the consumer revolution as they watched hospitals fall and insurers have record profits during the COVID crisis. They watched the underserved and minority population dwindle because we had failed to address the social determinants, and they recognized that things that they took for granted were difficult in healthcare. Even telehealth, believe it or not, in 2020 was viewed as a new technology. That failure of entrepreneurs and the traditional healthcare ecosystem to get together urgently to disrupt healthcare became incredibly visible throughout the COVID epidemic of 2020 to 2022. Throughout the crisis, no one worried about groups of people congregating at banks to get their deposits checked because everything they should have happened in healthcare had already happened in banking. The data was continuous, owned by the consumer, and almost all transactions could be done at home in 2020 in banking, unlike healthcare. With health assurance, we moved from the Internet of Things to the Internet of You. I remember back at Davos in 2020, the CEO of a banking conglomerate came up to me and said, you know, 20 years ago, the true groups that had totally escaped the consumer revolution were banking and healthcare. Now you're alone. Think about how the pandemic, even back in 2020, would have been handled differently if we had continuous data coming in from patients through their wearables and other sources as it related to temperature, respiratory rate, and other vital signs. Or if 3D printers were as ubiquitous as cell phones. Simply put, in many cases, our care back then, our cars back then got better care than we do. They were constantly sending data to the cloud. It's hard to believe, but only 10 years ago in 2020, people were going once a year for a static physical to an office as opposed to what we have become accustomed to, your T-shirt sending continuous data with AI filtering and human interaction when necessary. For example, the discrepancy between those healthcare systems that had a strategic alliance with a payer versus those that didn't came into sharp view during the COVID crisis. Healthcare providers were forced into canceling elective or non-essential surgeries and outpatient visits. The very services that brought in the dollars for the fee-for-service sick care world to subsidize the money losing chronic care management. Meanwhile, payers that already received their premiums had huge reserves and were paying out much less because these services were not being performed in order to conserve PPE. Since the system was not set up to be nimble, COVID pneumonias by and large were paid for as run of the mill pneumonias, despite the fact that the expenses for the provider for that care were often quintupled. Bottom line, providers were forced to put thousands of employees on furloughs or layoffs. Insurers were able to decrease their medical loss ratios, and patients who lost their job often also lost their health insurance. For places like Kaiser and other integrated payer provider systems, they were to work out the economic maelstrom. Everyone else was left to react and fend for themselves and their employees. All in all, great progress was made in delivery of health, and the transformation would not have been as dramatic if not for the COVID crisis of 2020. 
In some respect, in a weird way, more lives were saved over the past 10 years because of the pandemic of 2020 to 2022 was a jolt and lightning rod for American health care to have an extreme makeover and for the sick system to finally get well. So how do we get from 2020 to 2030? Well, I want to take you back. I had an opportunity to work with Apple uh, in the pre-iPhone era. And John Scully, who had become the CEO of Apple to sort of get Steve Jobs to understand corporate America, had asked Steve to come up with a strategic and business plan like they had at Pepsi, which he ran. John's view of that was a very large, glossy brochure with spreadsheets, McKinsey, Accenture helping out. Steve's version was simply this. Here's my three-year business plan. Year one, we change. Year two, we change the industry. Year three, we change the world. So how do we change? Well, a book was written by one of my mentors, a guy named Bill Kissick at Wharton, who literally talked about the Iron Triangle of healthcare. The book was called Medicine's Dilemmas, Infinite Needs, Finite Resources. Sound familiar? And he said, there's an iron triangle of access, quality, and cost. If you increase access, you either have to increase cost or decrease quality, and you can go down the, the geometric line. He said, unless you're willing to disrupt the system, and disruption is painful. And literally for that whole early part of the decade of the 21st century, think about what our health policy was. The Affordable Care Act, President Obama said, this will increase access, increase quality, and decrease cost, and it won't be painful. That's impossible. President Trump said, my health care program will be terrific, fantastic, unbelievable, and huge, and it wasn't. But the simple fact is nobody wanted to do the disruptive things that would have really made the difference. This is healthcare's Amazon moment. If you're a provider and think you're going to go back to your business model, solely being based on hospital revenue and not relevant to people who want care at home, I think you'll be out of business. If you're an insurer and you think you can just be the middleman between the hospital and the patient, you'll be irrelevant. If hospitals believe that innovation could just be this cute little thing that they do in the background, but the real business is just getting heads and beds, they're nuts. I think we were always wondering what the big disruption would be that got us to join the consumer revolution, and I really believe that this is it. So let's think about the Iron Triangle in a very different way, from the patient's point of view, because people don't view themselves as patients. They view themselves as people they want to be able to thrive without health getting in the way. They want to be able to connect and have human relationships with health care providers when they need it. They want to be able to easily navigate health care on their own terms like they can every other part of their life. And they also want to be able to understand what they do. And understanding is different than transparency. Transparency is CMS saying that I have to put my ChargeMaster 2800 page Excel spreadsheet on the internet. Transparency is, I need a hip replacement. I run half marathons. I want to know, based on your outcomes, what are the chances that I can do a half marathon in a year? Exactly what will it cost me? What rate of readmissions do you have and who will pay for it? What do patients say about you? And then I want to be able to go to other providers and get that information, just like I can in every other part of my life. That was the main thing that changed. At Jefferson, we made that decision in 2017, that we were going to go to a four-pillar model, what Steve Jobs used to call the old math and the new math. The old math was making computers and operating systems, which was the only math back then. The new math was the digital lifestyle. In our world, the old math is tuition, academics, and our 14 hospital system. The new math was innovation and strategic partnerships. And right around 2020, the Innovation Strategic Partnerships pillar actually became our most successful pillar. So the question for us when I got a chance to take over Jefferson in 2013, can a 195-year-old academic medical center act like a startup company? And we made a few assumptions. We assumed that we would get paid based on quality, cost, patient experience and outcomes. We assumed that our hospital stays would become commoditized. 
we assume that our doctors and nurses will not only have to uh, work with but cooperate with deep learning entities. It took us about 50 years to get doctors and nurses to work together. Now we're going to have to get doctors and robots to work together. We also recognize that if that's the case, that we need to select and educate our humans differently. And the population health, predictive analytics, and social determinants really need to move to the mainstream of clinical care, payment models, and medical education. When I started out in obstetrics, what would happen is a young woman would think that she might be pregnant. We'd do a pregnancy test, go to her family doctor, say, congratulations, Mrs. Jones. I'm going to send you to my obstetrician, Dr. Clasco. The chances that a 28-year-old person today will just take that advice for the most important thing in their life from a 64-year-old male primary care doctor are zero. So she'll say, well, that might be who you'd go to if you get pregnant, which you, you probably won't. I'm going to talk to friends. I'm going to look on the Internet and decide who best matches what I need. So we decided actually to create that match.com between patients and providers because finding the right doctor shouldn't be so hard. Same thing with remote monitoring. We're working with a company that literally can do most of pregnancy testing at home. Now think about this post-COVID, not just immediately, for years to come. The chances that a patient that needs three time a week non-stress tests will say, oh, let me get this straight. You want me to come into Philadelphia, pay $35 each time to park, go to a place where there's a lot of sick people, go up in an elevator, have somebody put a monitor on me that's been put on 10 other people so I can stare at the ceiling and have a nurse come in in two hours to tell me that the baby's normal. When I can do that at home while I'm binge watching my favorite show with a glass of lemonade. That's really the difference that once people start to see those alternatives. And I really think Jack Ma at uh, Davos last year really put it best. No matter how artificial intelligence is good, human being in the future competed with machine on knowledge, you don't have a chance. Computer is always going to be smarter than you are. When there's a car, forget about it who runs faster. When there's a plane, don't think you can fly like a... When there's a computer, you know, computer is always smarter than you are. They never f forget. They remember everything. They never get angry. They calculate faster. Mm -hmm. But computer can never be as wise as a man. What's the difference between smart and wisdom? So how do we change the world in healthcare? So let me tell you what scares me about the digital acceleration caused by COVID-19. It's that we'll get it wrong. We have this unprecedented opportunity to shape this 30-year industrial cycle that will transform almost every sector of the world economy. We now know that digital technology will be ubiquitous. We'll stop calling it digital, just like we don't call it telebanking. But it's our responsibility to get this right, to create the restructuring of the next 100 years that will leave the world a better place. I think we now know that this new technology will be infused throughout the world economy. That means the pressure is on us to make sure it's done responsibly. In some respects, that's why Heyman and I started talking about on healthcare. We're convinced that truly putting the person in the center, whether that person is a patient or not, can integrate healthcare, make it consumer friendly, but also solve the health disparities that help create 20 year life expectancy gaps between zip codes in America. But only if we design the unhealth care system with those disparities and with that ethics in mind. So what happens if robots and humans actually start to work together to provide better health? I wrote an article for Modern Healthcare after my time at the World Economic Forum, and we're actually working in that stakeholder capitalism world about recognizing that the two crises that really do not have any borders are both climate change and healthcare inequities. So here's what happens once you go from sick care to health insurance. I, I mentioned the pregnancy model of the difference between having to come into the hospital three times a week to get your baby monitored versus being able to do it at work or home. So what does that have to do with disparities? Well, the simple fact is that we are somewhere around number 45 of 100 developed countries in maternal mortality and neonatal morbidity. Now think about that. Why is that? With all the resources we have, we're by far the most expensive. It's because of that, uh, that gap.
And just think back to the testing model. If you're, if you're a wealthy person, no problem coming into the hospital three times a week, paying for parking, taking the time off. If you're in a very different situation where you can't take that time off, or you can't afford childcare, or you don't have money for gas in your car, what you do is you just don't get the testing. Once we democratize that testing, though, by being able to do it at home, literally we're able to make significant changes in, in maternal outcomes. There is no reason, no reason, that in a place like Philadelphia with six academic medical centers should be a 21-year disparity between going six miles on either side of the Rocky statue. So one of the things that came out of our Davos discussions were that we need large-scale transformations in healthcare to both survive as a business and have a positive societal outcome. And again, I believe that COVID will be a nod for that. The fourth industrial revolution will give us the tools and data to do this, but we need to proactively address the human and ethical consequences up front. And healthcare and academic success, two areas that really need to go through disruption, will require changes in our way of thinking, creative partnerships to create new ecosystems. And by the way, there is no such thing as non-disruptive disruption. It will be painful for those who don't want to think differently as these new ecosystems are built. That's been true in every area that's been transformed. Think Sears and Pennies. Think travel agents that didn't get the importance of e-travel. Oh, and what about food deserts? Well, think about this. In 2020, the reason there were food deserts was because certain zip codes, those one with long life expectancies, might be able to walk to two or three Whole Foods or Trader Joe's. The ones with much less life expectancies could only walk to a bodega that sold corn chips and sodas. And they might not have been able to afford, afford the gas. The combination of enlightened health policy and drone delivery of food changed all that. The enlightened health policy was that if you're willing to give your your family healthy meals, we'll give you 50% more electronic food transfers if you're on food assistance. And by the way, we'll drone deliver to you, literally eliminating food as deserts. Just one of the examples where smart policy, AI, and a human component made a difference. Oh, and the final mandate for AI, we finally started to learn from our mistakes. Fun, sexy, safe. Just like that guy, we keep making the same mistake over and over again. So we started to look at simulation in a whole different way, transplanting medical advices, advances in knowledge into improved patient care through procedure rehearsal studios. I'm a private pilot, and every two years I have to get my technical competence assessed. As a surgeon, nobody's assessed my objectively my technical competence in 30 years. In fact, we talk about the way training is. If you ask any surgeon, how did you learn this procedure? See one, do one, teach one. That makes zero sense in 2020. And over the decade from 2020 to 2030, that went away. Just to give you an example, I learned how to intubate a one and a half pound baby in the middle of a chaotic delivery room. Now, nobody does that until they've proven that they can do it on one of these simulated little one and a half pound uh, robot babies, knowing that they can do it safely before they get to a human. Jason Kidd got traded to the Dallas Mavericks, uh, and the team had been 24 or 52. And at his press conference, this is what he said. We're going to turn this team around 360 degrees. We do a lot of turning things around 360 degrees and ending up in the same place in healthcare. And that's what really had to change starting in 2020. And most importantly, if there's one thing that this crisis has shown us is 
that we have to have to have to start now. Thank you very much. So let me give you a few surprises uh, and really cut the suspense. You did start in 2020. You did make those changes. You did go from Secure to Health Assurance. And that's why things are so good in 2030. Oh, and by the way, one other surprise. I'm not really me. I'm a hologram of me coming back to let you know that you're just about to start a renaissance in healthcare. Okay, well, that was inspirational. Thank you, Dr. Clasco. The only thing that would have been better is if you sang your own song. So, uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, I'm going to start us off with a question, and we'll put some of your polls in between those questions. Uh, but uh, the first question, you know, the audience, I think, is all in. I see some things coming up. But how do you see it getting implemented? That's really the question. Is this going to be private, public, mixture? How do you get these people to change? I think I think what, what we'll see start to happen, I think we're already seeing it start to happen, is that It'll start off with, uh, with venture capitalists and others looking at healthcare as an opportunity for the first time. And I think what we'll start to get is, is sort of a movement where patients will have their I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore moment, especially younger patients. So, you know, when you look at the amount of, of dollars, I mean, we're talking billions and billions and billions of dollars that are being literally thrown into healthcare startups. And a lot of those healthcare startups, frankly, are things that we could have done, right? So, I mean, if, if you think about it, even telehealth, um, the, the last two IPOs, American Well and Teladoc, are now worth $60, $70, $80 billion. But back in 2012, 2011, when people went to us and said, what do you think about telehealth? We said, well, well you know, that's, that's pretty stupid. Why can't people come to my office? So I think when you start to look at some of these startups that have started to do, you know, Optum and, and, and Oak Street Health and ChenMed and some others. It's really just providing that kind of level of service that I talked about in, 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 in the video. And I think what will happen is, is more places will start to look at the way we're looking at it is my survival is going to be dependent on being this sort of old academic medical center that can think creative, nimbly, and flexibly. And so I think what you'll see is like we saw in, in, other, in, in other areas. Look at Target and Walmart, right? I mean, you look at Sears and Petty's when the Amazon retail revolution happened, and they just said, hey, nobody's going to buy e-stuff. Target and Walmart said, hey, we're really good at stores, but we also have to get into this game. And, and I think for healthcare, we're going to say, hey, we're really good at taking care of orthopedic surgery patients and pancreatic cancer patients, and that's, that's what our hospitals do, that's what our providers do, but we also have to be there for, for the wellness and health of folks in the same way that the startups are. Steve, thank you. This, this is uh, really fascinating. Um, I'm, I'm not uh, working with, with Steve Clasco as my CEO yet. He wants to do the right things, but as you said, it is disruptive and there's, there's fears he's held accountable for bottom lines of, of do you take a plunge too soon? How, how do I, how do I get him to say, you know what? It's, it's time to follow Thomas Jefferson. It's time to do that. Yeah. So look, I think it's. Um, I, th I think every place has some local politics. We were fortunate in orthopedic surgery because you, you know we work with the Rothman Institute, and you know they they were leading that. In fact, when when, when I came to um, when, when I started Jefferson, they had moved you know six hundred seven hundred cases out of the, our expensive academic medical center hospital to their own hospital. We ended up purchasing some of that. And now they're doing a lot of that outpatient. So in orthopedic surgery, we didn't have to force anybody. In most everything else, it was a combination. In some cases, it was brute force. I mean, when, when we went, when we started telehealth in 2013, I went to every chair and said, in order to get your incentive, you have to get 80% of your faculty to participate in and train for telehealth. They weren't bought in, but they did it. In other things, um, you know, one of the one of the real secrets, especially for large systems, is looking at your employees, James. So when we when we actually came up with a model of an all emergency medicine Jeff Connect telehealth system, 
And we said we can move 50% of our non-trauma, non-ambulance patients out of our expensive, inefficient ED into telehealth, urgent care, or an appointment the next morning. We would have gotten killed financially, exactly to your point, because the insurers were thrilled to pay me an average of $1,500 if somebody showed up to my ED, whether they needed to or not, because I'm going to do all these tests and stuff, and maybe an average of about $90, you know, in those other three modalities. So we started with our 30,000 employees. And what, what we did was, you know, we, our, for our employees and our families, we, we worked with Aetna, and we had a $500 deductible if you just showed up to the ED. And you had to pay 10% of your, of your, if you're an employee, you pay 10% of your, of your inpatient bill if you were admitted. If you went through Jeff Connect and we sent you to the emergency room, you paid zero. So literally, we were able to, we were not only able to prove that, you know, we were able to get 50% of the people out of our inefficient ED. They were thrilled because they were getting better care closer to home. And we saved about seven or eight million dollars. Then we could go to other insurers and frankly, other employers, because we're the second largest employer in Philadelphia, and say, look at what we did for ourselves. So it's a little bit like you can't go and get other people to do that if you can't prove you can do it for your own employees, right? It's like, you know, it's like I can't be the hair club for man guy. So 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 I think that that's that's really what's helped us. We've done a lot of our innovations with Bongo and telehealth and others, starting with our 30,000 employees. Great. So there are several um, questions here talking about equality. Will telehealth really fix that? I know you talked a little bit about this in your talk, but, you know, we've been talking about this for 100 years. How do we make it happen? Yeah, so, so look, I think the, you know, and, you know, I talked about the um, the Broadband Act of 2025. If there were, if, if, if there were, I am really disappointed, frankly, um, not to get into politics, but but neither party has talked about that. Um, broadband should be like electricity and plumbing. So you start that way. When you think about this pandemic, we have eight first neighborhoods in Philadelphia that don't have broadband. So their kids couldn't get educated and they couldn't participate in, in telehealth. And, and it's not a surprise that th those zip codes, people were hospitalized and died at a much other side of things, which is the which is the move fast and break things, uh, uh, Silicon Valley side, we really have to make sure that that those innovations are not just making the wealthy healthier. So one of the things in the book that I wrote with the uh, with the managing principal of General Catalyst, and General Catalyst is the group that started Airbnb and Stripe and Warby Parker and Lavongo. It starts off: What if a Silicon Valley entrepreneur and a CEO of a 195 year old academic medical center walked into a bar? got married and had a kid, what would that kid look like? Because they're really good at moving fast and breaking things, but they're looking at valuations and that kind of thing. We're really good at mission. I mean, our, our mission at Jefferson is to improve lives, but we haven't been creative, nimble, and flexible. So we actually started a, a group together called Tendo that is bringing all our digital experience together and their digital experience together. So what does that mean? It means exactly your point. What we've said is the number one thing we want you to work on, Tendo, is looking at the poorest zip codes in, in, in Philadelphia and how we can start to have some of this technology affect those, those social determinants. So I, th I showed the thing about food deserts. We're working with a, a couple companies, one's called City Block, that is looking at, at some of the poorest folks and how you can get care out to them at home. Um, there's other companies that are doing things around blue zones, even with the vaccines. We looked at sort of very innovative ways of getting out to the African American community in Philadelphia, which is the most, um, which is the most reticent, at least in our area, to get vaccines. So I, I think that that we have to stop talking about health disparities. We have to stop talking about health inequities. Frankly, we have to stop doing stupid studies about whether there's a 20-year difference or a 22-year difference in life expectancy among zip codes. And we have to start, you know, working with industry and others to say it's intolerable. You know, in Philadelphia, it's the headquarters of Comcast. So, you know, we're working with Comcast and saying, you know, how can we make sure that we start out with broadband and then we do the kind of education that we do? We're going to churches, we're going to, 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 to other social agencies and working with them. So we've got a bunch of surgeons uh, on, on this uh, session, obviously. And, and, and one of the questions that's coming up predictably is how do we compensate our physicians and our hospital administrators in this new age? How, how do we pay them competitively and get them to do less? 
Yeah, it's a, it's, um, it, it's a great question. So, um, I think, you know, a lot of people ask me, what are the two things that I've learned through the pandemic? And, and, and the one is, at least as, as, a, as a hospital CEO, you have to have an aligned payer provider model. I, I have no, no good future for somebody that doesn't have an aligned payer provider model. And when I say that, either own a payer, you know, like a UPMC or a Kaiser or a Geisinger, or start to really get into the percentage of premium. Because, you know, if you just think about it, James, you know, we, we, the whole idea of the Affordable Care Act was to bring, you know, a dollar quarter of care down to a dollar. So what would you have done? You would have sold all your United stock, your Cigna stock, because in every other thing, the, the middleman went down. Well, those stocks have gone up by 11 times. Pharma stocks have gone up by, you know, eight or nine times. Um, uh, even generic drug stocks have gone up. So if that middle has expanded <laughs> and you're trying to bring costs down, and you're giving more people access, then what's gonna happen is the providers are gonna to continue to get squeezed. So the key is you have to get into that percentage of premium. So at Jefferson, it ranges everything from a, an ACO we have with Mainline Health to uh, we, we have a merger going on. Now we've done five mergers in four years, but the next merger will, will result in us owning a Medicaid and Medicare Advantage insurer. To working with Independence Blue Cross and others, we have one of the, the largest value-based Things with them. Then you have to re-educate your docs around value. Yeah, so doing less is, in some cases, is better, yeah. and you will get rewarded. You can't, you did, what doesn't work is, is having a total RVU system and then telling people to do less, right? I mean, you know, that, that just doesn't make any sense. It's that Upton Sinclair thing. It's hard to get somebody to do something when their salary depends upon them not doing it. So, so I, I think that, 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 that as a provider, I mean, even with telehealth, when you look at some of the clawbacks in telehealth, telehealth prospered during the pandemic because there were laws that said you got to pay the same thing for a telehealth visit as you pay for an in-person visit. Well, in some states, that's already that's already gone back and said, you know, we're going to pay you $50 for telehealth visit and $250 to see your orthopedic surgeon in the office. Well, these same folks that just got killed during the pandemic are not going to basically just say, oh, sure, insurers, you can, you can save that $200. Again, if, if you've got that strategic alignment, then that makes a difference. So I think that that's, that's one key. And the second key, and I think orthopedic surgeons are, have been very good at this, is you have to participate in the innovations that are going on. One of the things that I said, I, I never again want to be at a HIMSS meeting with you know, 920, 25-year-olds telling me how they're going to transform healthcare if I buy their product. You know, so, so much of what we're doing now is co-developing and partnering so that we share in that equity. So the two growth areas are going to be uh, percentage of premium models and digital transformation. You have to make sure that your revenue is tied to that, I believe. Thank you. Um, there's been several questions on um, the explosion of ransomware attacks and the fact that privacy may be um, attacked and you know, obviously we are all dealing with the fact that we've never really controlled the internet. So what's the solution? It, well, if, if, I had, if I had the solution, I probably wouldn't be here. It'd be like buying Bitcoin at, at six cents. But um, um, so look, I think cybersecurity needs to move up to a board level thing. I believe that cybersecurity is, is really one of the, over the next five or six years, gonna be one of our biggest, biggest, biggest issues. I just did a, a, a webinar with uh, uh, one of the folks from the FBI and, and the AHA about this. So a, a few things. One is you have to recognize that, that these viruses, and this is a new type of virus, are coming into the easiest place they can come into. So a lot of times it's your anesthesia machine that has Windows 95, you know, that's tied into your epic system. Um, the other thing that we have to be worried about is as we start to get more consumer oriented at Jefferson, we have lots of programs that involve people's Apple watches and wearables and that kind of thing. And patients, for all the great reasons that patients can now, that I can find out what's happening at home with this patient, that, that, that cyber viruses now can get in through that aura ring or, 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 or Apple watch. So I think what you're gonna to start to see is huge investments in blockchain technology. 
uh, around, around this. And, and I, I was kidding around the cryptocurrency, but our head of HR is actually one of the cryptocurrency experts. And, and what he's really worked on is blockchain that makes cryptocurrency safe. You know, you know, that's the whole piece behind Bitcoin's explosion is that it's incredibly safe. Now, the problem with that is if you lose your code and have a million dollars in Bitcoin, nobody can get it, including you. So I think we're going to have to have, we're going to have to invest significantly in different levels of protection because I think um, what we're seeing in ransomware and, and cyber attacks, both from other countries and from individuals, is only going to accelerate. And I think, you know, you're going to see senior vice presidents for cybersecurity in, in, in most institutions. A question that, that uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on is that obviously the incorporation of technology has been a, a great and critical move in healthcare. It, the impressions that it gives better access, better technical information allows for metrics. How do we balance that with the most important aspect, which is the relationship between the healthcare provider and the patient, the, the human interaction, compassion, caring attitude? How do you get the best out of both? Yeah, I, th I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's an absolutely great point. And I think I actually am very optimistic that, 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 that those worlds will be able to come together. Uh, I really am. I think that, um, I, I think that um, here's how I look at it. I think, first of all, the way we educate and select physicians has to change. If, 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 if there's going to be a, um, a robot next to me when I deliver a baby, they can take a picture of that baby and be better than any human in deciding what the chromosomal abnormality is. Then does it really matter if I can memorize the Krebs cycle uh, to be an obstetrician? Um, so I think what will start to happen is we need to start selecting students based more on self-awareness, empathy, communication skills, and cultural competence. By the way, that has a huge diversity issue because in Philadelphia, if you want to think about the tale of two cities, there are moms and dads that pay $100,000 to get little Johnny or little Mary five Princeton reviews and three, you know, and, 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 and three tutors so they can ace the med cats. Like that's without even Photoshopping their, their face on a, on, a, on a cross player, like doing it legally. And there's another kid that just wants to go back to his or her neighborhood and practice that has a battered batter's book. Well, that's not fair. When, when you start, we have started a medical school, 56 students a year on holistic criteria, tripled the diversity. Because when you start doing it based on why you really want to be a doctor and, 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 and communication skills, et cetera. So I think that's one thing. The second thing is, if we do this right, if we do this right, and when I wake up, if my T-shirt is sending continuous data, and when I wake up and talk to Alexa, and Alexa says, you know, hey, take an extra inhaler because this is what the, what the um, uh, uh, pollution is today, then doctors won't need to do some of the rote things. Uh, because that, that data is, is coming in constantly. Patients will come in and see physicians and nurses when they need that human interaction. I'm sure for every one of the orthopedic surgeons out there is your time, because of all the administrative hassles and everything else, your time of actually spending with a patient, patient has, been, has been really contracted. Uh, the future I see is one where you're doing a patient interaction it's because you really, need, you really need to have that human interaction. And I think it'll actually be be more fun to practice. EM, EMRs, you know, are just a great example of, of technology going amok, right? I mean, EMRs are the first technology in the history of the universe where you need more humans just to get back to where you were as far as the, the, the patient-physician interaction. So, so when I work with Silicon Valley, my goal is to make sure that everything that we're doing together with our partners at GC or others is how do we potentiate the human orthopedic surgeon or the human obstetrician. Well, we can't thank you enough for that one, Dr. Clasco. That was a great, great session. Uh, we are now going over to Amber to look at where we're at with our drawing. Amber, what do you have? Thanks, Amy. Uh, please just let me know if it does share on your screen. Hopefully it will. Um, Stephen, that was amazing. That was so inspiring. So thank you for that. Um, I really, really love, you know, everything we spoke about, about the doctors and robots needing to work, learn to work together. Um, and then in turn, kind of the technology that we develop, having to then work for the consumer too. We Everything has to work in sync 
everything has to work in a human way, despite it being technology based. Um, that was brilliant. Um, the healthcare at home, obviously, which is then connected to broadband, uh, should be available to everyone, the same as electricity and plumbing. Uh, and then aside from that, it's the kind of companies being responsible to react nimbly, agile and creatively. Uh, I loved the kind of uh, coronaviruses, the lightning rod, the change, uh, the triangle we spoke about, the quality, access and cost. And then most importantly, I think the transparency um, across the board of, of companies, physicians and all involved um, the responsibility we all have. So thank you very much. Great. Oh, great job. Wow, I can't believe you did that all in uh, 45 minutes. Great talent. Uh, thank you.